Hi, my name is Scott Young, and I'm a physical therapist at Agile PT located in Palo Alto. During this time of shelter in place, we wanted to educate and empower our community on steps that can be taken to reduce our collective fall risk. The material discussed in this presentation is meant to be informational and is not meant to be used as medical advice. If you have any specific questions or concerns regarding your health status, current situation, or home environment, please reach out to your health care provider. By the end of the presentation, we hope that you will be able to understand the consequences of falls, identify risk factors, identify modifiable behaviors, identify appropriate assistive devices and their intended use, identify strategies for making a safer home environment, learn how to fall safer, learn how to get up from a fall, and finally, determine if you might be at risk for falls. The CDC defines falls as an inadvertent coming to rest on the ground, floor, or other lower levels, excluding intentional change in position to rest in furniture, wall, or other objects. We know that most falls occur in the home environment and that they happen at ground level and not from an elevated surface. There is a prevailing notion that with our increasing lifespan, falls are just bound to happen. This is simply untrue, and this line of thinking serves as a barrier to actively taking preventative measures. Quite possibly the most important thing that you can take away from this presentation is this. Falls are not inevitable. There are many steps that we can take to reduce the risk for future falls. As you can imagine, the consequences of falls can run the gamut. Near or minor falls might leave you shaken up or maybe lead to a bad bruise. However, every 11 seconds an older adult is treated in the ER due to a fall. This may possibly lead to a hospitalization, surgery, extended rehabilitation in a rehab center or nursing home and a significant financial burden. In 2015, we spent $50 billion on non-fatal falls and $754 million on fatal falls. The average direct cost of a non-fatal fall injury was $9,780, and the average direct cost of a fatal fall was $26,340. It is projected that the $50 billion we spent in 2015 will rise to $67.7 billion in 2020 and by 2040, we will likely spend $240 billion annually. Additional consequences of the loss of mobility. Individuals who did not require any assistive devices to move around may now need to rely on canes. Those who used canes might have to transition to more supportive devices like walkers and so forth. The general loss of independence may lead some to using adaptive equipment to dress, bathe, and use the bathroom. There is a potential increased reliance on caregivers for daily tasks, be it from family members or nursing assistants. There are also many instances where the loss of independence might mean the difficult transition from living in your home to living in an assisted living facility. Nothing is more scary than not being able to trust your own body or not being able to take care of yourself. It is very common for those who have had a fall to worry about future falls. Falls can also lead to reduced social and activity participation. Increased social isolation is correlated to depression. When individuals become less active, they also become weaker and increase their chance of future falls. And the most devastating consequence of falls is death. Every 19 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. Somewhere between 1 in 3 and 1 in 4 Americans aged 65 years and older will fall this year. This demographic represents the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. The average life expectancy for both men and women is increasing in part because of better medical management of chronic conditions and disease. This 1 in 3 and 1 in 4 number might also be a bit underrepresented. Roughly half of older adults will not inform their family or health care providers of a fall. A common rationale as to why there is such underreporting is that individuals may fear that by acknowledging it, it will lead to a loss of their independence. The data indicates that Caucasians living in the USA have higher risk of falls. Their rate of hospitalization is two to four times greater than that of Hispanics and Asians living in the USA, and also 20% greater than that of African Americans living in the USA. Women fall more than men, however, men are more likely to die from falls. The data indicates that men generally have more comorbid conditions than women of the same age and engage in greater risk-taking behaviors. Falls from ladders, falls from standing on unsteady chairs, and drinking may lead to more serious injuries, head traumas, and can cause greater post-fall medical complications. Over one in five falls may lead to serious injuries such as fractures and head injuries. Falls are the most common cause of traumatic brain injuries. Falls account for 87% of all fractures for older adults. 95% of fractures are due to falls. 
These falls are typically sideways directly onto the hip bone. Women are more likely to have osteopenia and osteoporosis compared to men. They account for 75% of all hip fractures. Sadly, 50% of all older adults lose so much function that they are unable to return to their homes post-fall. Living in a nursing home is not necessarily safer. Over 60% of residents fall annually. This graph from the CDC and the National Council on Aging shows that fatal fall rates increase exponentially with age for both sexes. As you move right on this chart, you can see that the highest rate of fatal falls are for individuals 85 years and older. This table shows the 10 leading causes of unintentional injury deaths by age group. If you look towards the top right, you can see that falls are the third leading cause of injury deaths across all age groups, only behind unintentional poisonings and motor vehicle accidents. If we zoom into the age group of adults aged 65 years and up, falls are now the leading cause of unintentional injury deaths. From 2007 to 2016, the fall death rate has increased by 30%, which is an average of a 3% uptick annually. At this rate, we project seven fall deaths every hour by 2030. As you can see here, there is an interplay between various risk factors and falls and fall-related injuries. The more risk factors we have, the greater the risk of fall and injury. Some risk factors are non-modifiable, and some we cannot control or change on a personal level. However, there are other risk factors that we absolutely have the ability to change for the better. Here are some biologic risk factors. Age, sex, and race are considered non-modifiable. As mentioned previously, older adults are at greater risk for falls, as are females and Caucasians living in the USA. In a few moments, I will propose a different viewpoint in that age might be somewhat modifiable and that we have the capacity to make ourselves older or younger. Additional non-modifiable risk factors are previous falls. If you have had a prior fall, you are five times more likely than an age match peer to have a future fall. Fear of falling also increases risk for falls based on changes in behavior that might put you at increased risk, such as going out less frequently and moving less. Chronologic age is the amount of time that has passed since you were born. It always increases at a set rate as time passes. Biologic age is a reflection on how your body functions. This factors into account chronologic age, genetics, comorbidities, nutrition, and lifestyle. With certain lifestyle modifications, you can have a younger biologic age than your chronologic age. An increased focus on wellness, such as improving your eating, sleeping, and exercise habits can go a long way. It is never too late to take action. This is Shirley Webb. In 2014, she joined her local gym at the request of her granddaughter because, quote, at the time I couldn't walk up the stairs unless I held onto a handrail, and if I got on the floor I couldn't get up without a chair. Now I can come right off the floor. The harder I work out, the better I feel. Shirley had never done any weightlifting until she was 76 years old. This is her at age 78 deadlifting 225 pounds for three reps. Well, this will make you feel weak. Check out Shirley. She's 78 years old and deadlifting 225 pounds. That alone is impressive, but she does it three times. Yeah, 225 three times. She has 50 years on me and I can't even lift that once. Shirley, teach me your ways. Here are some conditions that contribute to biologic fall risk factors. Sleep disturbances can lead to daytime disorientation and reduce ability to negotiate hazards in the physical environment. Depression can lead to increased social isolation, less physical activity, deconditioning, and falls. Chronic pain can alter how we move, and these compensatory changes lead to increased risk for falls. Diabetes can impair sensation and balance. Vestibular conditions can upset our balance and equilibrium. A vestibular trained physical therapist can help you manage vestibular disorders. Neurologic diseases such as stroke, Parkinson's disease, MS, and dementia are all associated with increased risk for falls. Age-related cognitive and affective decline impairs memory and judgment and leads to increased fall risk. Age-related physical decline can affect the domains below. As we age, we are more prone to orthostatic hypotension. We will discuss what this condition is on the next few slides. Impairments in hearing and vision, 
pain in weight-bearing joints, loss of strength and flexibility, impairments in sensation, proprioception, and balance. Incontinence. With incontinence, the urgency make an individual rush and move in an unsafe yet hurried manner. And finally, slower normal walking speeds. It is noted that a gait speed less than one meter per second is predictive of future falls. An important side note is this. Walking faster will not reduce your fall risk. Orthostatic hypotension is a form of postural hypotension or low blood pressure that can occur with sudden changes in position. Symptoms may last up to a few minutes. The most common symptoms are lightheadedness or dizziness. Additional symptoms may include blurred vision, confusion, nausea, weakness, feeling faint, and syncope, which is the loss of consciousness. Please speak with your doctor if you have any of these symptoms and to also review medications that might be contributing to this condition. When we transition vertically, such as moving from lying to sitting or sitting to standing, blood pools to the abdomen and legs, thereby decreasing blood pressure. Normally, special cells called baroreceptors sense this pressure drop and signal the brain to increase heart rate and cause arteries to constrict in order to stabilize blood pressure. Orthostatic hypotension occurs when something interrupts the body's natural process of counteracting low blood pressure. Orthostatic hypotension is common in those who are 65 years and older. It may become more difficult for the body to respond as efficiently to changes in blood pressure. Orthostatic hypotension is affected by hydration levels. It can reflect an inadequate amount of fluids in, such as when we are not drinking enough water, or an excess of fluids out in cases of diarrhea, vomiting, excess sweating, and taking diuretics. Caffeinated beverages like coffee is a diuretic. Being in a hot environment can cause heavier sweating and perspiration leading to lower baseline blood pressure. Prolonged bed rest can lead to general deconditioning. The body then becomes less resilient and weaker in adjusting to position changes. Orthostatic hypotension can occur more frequently in the early morning due to our blood pressure being generally lower at that time. Older adults generally experience lower blood pressure after eating meals. Straining on the toilet, exercise, and alcohol consumption can all increase your risk of orthostatic hypotension. Here are some general tips to manage orthostatic hypotension. Speak with your physician and discuss if any medication should be reduced or stopped. Hydrate with six to eight glasses of water or low calorie drinks unless told to limit your fluid intake. If getting out of bed, move slowly and sit at the edge of the bed until any symptoms subside. You can help pump your blood back upwards by slowly moving your feet up and down. If transitioning from sit to stand, consider holding onto something firm and don't start walking until you are fully adjusted to the upright position. We will now discuss behavioral risk factors for falls. These are generally modifiable. The side effects from both prescription and over-the-counter medications may put individuals at increased risk for falls. Polypharmacy is the use of multiple medications to treat other health conditions. While therapeutic for the conditions at hand, more medication use and their potential interaction with each other is linked to increased risk for falls. It is suggested that you review your medication list with your physician. Here are some medications that are linked to falls. Some are psychoactive in nature and may include anticonvulsants, antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, opioids, and sedative hypnotics. Medications that cause dizziness, drowsiness, confusion, blurred vision, and orthostatic hypotension may include anticholinergics, antihistamines, blood pressure medications, and muscle relaxants. In general, with consultation from your physician, stop taking medications whenever possible, switch to safer alternatives, and reduce medication use to the lowest effective dose. Here are additional behavioral risk factors. They are modifiable and concern human actions, emotions, and daily choices. They include decreased social participation, a sedentary lifestyle, excess alcohol use, substance abuse, improper or poor footwear, standing on an unsteady chair to reach for items up high, not using medically recommended assistive devices, and improper use of assistive devices. As physical therapists, we work with patients who have impairments in strength, balance, and flexibility, and we often get referrals from physicians to teach patients about assistive devices and how to use them properly, in addition to working collaboratively to improve their gait with or without the use of such aids. 
Canes, crutches, walking sticks, and walkers are safe and effective tools that are at times underutilized. They benefit individuals with an unstable gait who may have decreased sensation, balance, strength, endurance, and pain. Assistive devices provide a wider base of support and act as an additional contact point on the ground, thereby improving stability. Depending on what type of equipment an individual is using, it can safely offload weight from a painful or weaker leg. The choice of an appropriate device depends on the individual. Strength, endurance, vision, cognitive function, and environmental demands play an important role in selection. For instance, if someone uses a rolling walker and lives in a two-story home, they might need a cane to help get up the stairs and a second rolling walker for the upstairs floor. From my experience, the stigma of using an assistive device can be a huge barrier and impediment for an individual to move around their home and community in a safe fashion. I'd like to point out that using an assistive device improves an individual's safe home and community access and allows them to continue to visit their family, friends, and shop at the stores that they love. Canes assist with balance and are not meant to be used as a weight-bearing device. The ideal height of a cane should be that the handle is at the level of an individual's wrist crease. This should allow some bend in the elbow. The single most common question that we often get is which side should the cane be held on? It should be used on the side opposite the weaker or more painful leg. The reason is this. When we normally walk, our opposite arm and leg move together as a unit. If you look at the image above, the man is holding the cane in his right hand. When he walks, his left leg and right arm move together. So if his left leg is weaker or more painful, the cane in his right hand can help provide some support. Here are three commonly used canes. As we move from left to right on the slide, each cane provides additional stability. The first cane, the standard cane, is lightweight and helps with balance for those who do not need their arms to bear weight. The middle offset cane distributes the individual's upper extremity weight directly over the shaft of the cane, making it a little bit more sturdy than the standard cane. This can help with occasional offloading of a weaker painful leg, but again, canes are not technically a weight-bearing device. The quad cane on the right has four contact points and the widest base of support, making it the most steady of the three canes pictured above but it's also the heaviest, and it can be cumbersome to use as you need to have all four points on the ground simultaneously to use properly. Here is another type of cane that is popular with patients and physical therapists alike. This cane has a larger ground contact surface area and a pivoting base, making it a bit more sturdy than a standard cane, but more agile than a quad cane. Forearm crutches and hiking poles are more supportive than the canes previously discussed. They come in pairs, but can be used separately. They also allow greater weight bearing. The ideal height of a forearm crutch is similar to that of a cane. The handle should meet at the individual's wrist crease and allow some bend in their elbow. For the hiking pole, the ideal height should allow the user to have a 90 degree bend in their elbow when the pole is on the ground near their foot. Similar to the cane, when using a crutch or hiking pole for solo use, the device should be used on the side opposite of the weaker or painful leg. This allows for a natural gait pattern. As you can see, the cuff of the forearm crutch allows the forearm to bear some weight and is thus sturdier than a cane. The cuff also allows the user to let go of the crutch for hand use without having to drop the device or lean it on a nearby table or chair. While forearm crutches tend to not be as popular due to the stigma of being the polio crutch, they are a safe and streamlined device that can assist with walking. Contrary to forearm crutches, hiking poles tend to have a more favorable stigma as they are typically used by active individuals. As you can see in the picture above, they can be used separately or in pairs. When using in pairs, both poles move together with the weaker or painful leg simultaneously. Here is a brief tutorial on how to sequence and navigate stairs with a cane or crutch. When ascending stairs, the device stays on the lower level. Begin by stepping up with your stronger leg so your stronger leg does most of the work. You can also push down with your arms onto the handrail and device. The weaker leg then follows the stronger leg to the next step, followed by the cane. Repeat this pattern as necessary. When descending stairs, the device first moves to the lower step. Also move down the hand that is holding onto the handrail in front of you. Step down with your weaker leg. The reason why this pattern is encouraged is that if your weaker leg moves down, it is your stronger leg that is doing the work to squat you down. Once your weaker leg is on the lower step, step down to the same step with your stronger leg. Repeat this pattern as necessary. It can be challenging to remember this pattern. A simple way to help remember the leg sequencing is up with the good and down with the bad.
Regardless of which direction you are going, the assistive device always starts on the lower step. Walkers are more supportive than canes, crutches, and hiking poles. They assist both with balance and weight bearing and provides a wide base of support. Similar to canes, the ideal height of a walker should allow the handles to meet roughly at the user's wrist crease and permit some bend in the elbow. Some of the drawbacks of walkers is that they can slip forward and tip backwards. It can be difficult to maneuver in small spaces and they cannot be used on stairs. One dangerous habit that some individuals do is keeping both hands on their walker when standing up. We recommend to only place one hand on the walker for these transfers, while the other hand assists by pushing off from the surface they are standing up from. Here are three types of walkers. On the left you have the standard walker. Standard walkers are the most stable, but this results in a slower gait speed as the user must completely lift the walker off the ground with each step. Rolling walkers are a little less stable than standard walkers, but they allow for a more normal gait pattern and speed due to the wheels in the front. Rollators are the least stable of the walkers, but the easiest to repel as it has four wheels. It is also the most convenient as it typically has a storage basket and a seat. Rollators come with significant risks as they can roll forward unexpectedly. There are parking brakes to enable safer sitting and standing transfers. However, many falls occur because users forget to lock them. For these reasons, rollators may not always be safe or appropriate for those with significant balance problems or cognitive impairments. We will now discuss some of the modifiable environmental hazards in the home and how to address them. These items cause many of the trip and fall accidents. Loose items, wires, cords, and clutter on the floor can serve as unexpected obstacles in home walking paths. Shoes and pet toys are common culprits. Consider reorganizing your home to remove these unnecessary hazards and clear your walkways. Throw rugs are dangerous, and from my experience both professionally and personally, I've received a lot of pushback from patients and family members as to why they absolutely need to hang on to them. Throw rugs often slip due to inadequate traction, and also the slightly different height relative to the ground that they rest on often leads people to accidentally catching a toe, leading to a trip and fall. Inappropriate footwear is another environmental hazard. Walking with socks and surfaces such as hardwood and tile can be a slippery experience as there is inadequate traction. Even non-slip socks, if sized improperly, can be hazardous if the traction side rotates up. I'm referring more to the oversized hospital socks that we sometimes get after surgery. Shoes that are ill-fitting or worn can reduce proper traction and also lead to falls. Wet, slick, slippery surfaces in the bathroom or other common areas can be hazardous. Consider using a non-slip bath or shower mat and have someone install a grab bar for security. Any spills in common areas should be cleaned up immediately. Don't just assume it will dry with time. Older homes may have uneven and irregular stairs. If possible, have someone fix them to reduce this fall hazard. And if your stairs do not have handrails, consider hiring someone to install some handrails. As we age, it is natural for our vision to deteriorate, and the lack of adequate lighting can further impair our ability to see properly and assess the environment. To improve lighting, consider installing additional lights and use brighter bulbs in poorly lit and commonly traversed pathways. Consider installing nightlights along pathways from the bedroom to the bathroom for nighttime bathroom use. Also consider hanging and using lightweight shades and curtains to reduce sun glare through windows. Low toilets and chairs put more physiologic demand on our body when standing up and sitting down. If we don't have adequate leg strength, we might need to use our hands and push off of surfaces that were not intended to bear weight. A safer alternative to pushing off from a towel rack in the bathroom is to install a grab bar. You can also consider purchasing a raised toilet seat or commode. Consider replacing low chairs with higher ones, which will make your sit-to-stand transfers safer and easier. While most falls in the home occur at ground level, we can further reduce our risk for falls by rearranging our cabinets by placing more commonly used items in cabinets that we can reach without having to use a step stool. Additionally, make sure to close all lower cabinet and dishwasher doors so that they don't serve as unexpected barriers in our walking path. Knowing strategies on how to fall in a safer manner can help reduce injury severity if you find yourself losing your balance. In general, keep your body loose with your arms and legs bent. If you are holding onto any assistive device or objects, let go and avoid locking your shoulders, wrists, and elbows to minimize injury to these areas. As you fall, protect your head. Turn your head to the side if you find yourself falling forward. If you are falling backwards, tuck your chin to the chest as depicted above. 
Attempt to land on the fleshier parts of your body, such as your upper back, thighs, or buttocks. If you find yourself falling sideways, grab the side of your hip with your opposite hand. Most hip fractures are the result of a sideways fall directly onto the hip bone. If you can, try to roll out of a fall. This will spread out the impact of the fall over a larger surface area rather than having a concentrated amount of energy at one location. If you happen to fall on the ground, take a moment to make sure that you are okay and then call for help if someone is around. When ready, roll to one side and push your upper body off the floor. Slowly crawl and make your way over to a nearby chair or sturdy piece of furniture. Place your hands on the chair and turn yourself sideways so that one hip is touching the side of the seat. Then use your arms and legs to push yourself onto the chair. Sit for a few minutes and then tell someone what happened. The CDC offers a 12-question assessment to help determine your individual fall risk. If you score four or more points, you may be at risk for falls. Please discuss your results with your physician. We will go through this 12-question assessment together. Please keep a tally of your score. This is a yes-no survey for each item. Item 1. Yes or no. I have fallen in the past year. If this is true, give yourself two points. Item 2. I use or have been advised to use a cane or walker to get around safely. If this is true, give yourself two points. Item 3. Sometimes I feel unsteady when I am walking. If this is true, give yourself one point. Item 4. I steady myself by holding onto furniture when walking at home. If this is true, give yourself one point. I am worried about falling. If this is true, give yourself one point. I need to push with my hands to stand up from a chair. If this is true, give yourself one point. I have some trouble stepping up onto a curb. If this is true, give yourself one point. I often have to rush to the toilet. If this is true, give yourself one point. I have lost some feeling in my feet. If this is true, give yourself one point. I take medicines that sometimes make me feel lightheaded or more tired than usual. If this is true, give yourself one point. I take medicine to help me sleep or improve my mood. If this is true, give yourself one point. And the last item, I often feel sad or depressed. If this is true, give yourself one point. Now tally up the total amount of points. And if your cumulative score is four or more, you may be at risk for falls. Here is a review of four simple steps that can reduce your fall risk. Step one, tell a provider right away if you have fallen, worry about falling, or feel unsteady. Have your physician review your medications, even the over-the-counter ones. Ask your physician about taking vitamin D supplements to improve bone, muscle, and nerve health. Step two, exercise. Exercise is a holistic evidence-based treatment that reduces pain, improves strength, and can improve balance. Research has shown that community-based Tai Chi classes significantly reduces fall risk for the elderly. If you want to exercise but are unsure of what to do, repress physical therapy. We will collaboratively work together to help achieve your goals by designing a program to build strength, improve balance, restore flexibility, and improve your walking mechanics. Step 3. Have your eyes checked by an eye doctor at least once a year, and be sure to update your glasses as needed. Also, get your feet checked and wear supportive shoes with adequate traction. Step four, simply just make your home safer. Get rid of clutter, throw rugs, and other things that you can trip over. Improve the lighting in your home, install railings on your stairs, and add grab bars in your toilet and bath or shower as needed. In summary, falls have significant consequences and they are largely preventable. Speak up, your healthcare team is here to help. Thank you for watching our presentation. Agile's vision is to transform communities by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. If you have any questions specific to this presentation, 
please feel free to reach out to me at scottyoung at agilept.com.